going on, everybody? Good morning. Good morning. So she is legit telling the truth when it, we're talking about uh, it being hard for the ladies not to do stuff. There was like three or four times I had to tell people, like, don't do that. Because we just wanted to bless y'all. I had to keep Tracy from taking the, the stuff to go wash them. Um, I had to keep Clarice from putting tables back. I had to keep uh, Hannah from trying to help out with everything. Cause that's just <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was just, uh, but no, it's, it was definitely great to be able to bless you guys. Um, a couple things I want to talk about real quick before um, we get into the sermon. So uh, it was brought to my attention. There's something called the backpack bill. Has anybody heard of that? Um, basically, I, I'll never be somebody that advocates politics from the pulpit. I just, um, I think my stance when it comes to those things, when it comes to election time and things like that is, these are what the issues are. This is what the Bible says. Go out there and follow what the Bible says. But it's not my position as a pastor to tell you what to do when it comes to that. So I will never advocate one way or the other. That being said, we know what's going on in the public schools when it comes to um, Jesus and just trying to smash him out. It's been going on forever. Uh, the backpack bill is funding to help kids that want to go from a public school to a, a private school that talks about Jesus. So um, the if you want to write this down, the website is backpackbill.com. Um, they're going to be voting on it in a couple weeks. I think actually next week. So you might want to check that out and um, sign petitions, send info, um, however you feel that. But go ahead and check that out. It is definitely something worth looking at. Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about, we had the missionaries last week. Um, we had a goal that we wanted to raise for them of $400, and we ended up raising well over 1600 and yeah, yeah. So um, you guys are awesome, and you are. Uh, that is just showing that you actually do put your money where your mouth is. And um, so they were just blown away. They they had told me that you know we go to churches much much bigger than ours, and they don't give a third of what they got from us. So just saying, uh, it made me proud to hear that because you guys are just awesome. You guys are awesome. Um, so, yeah, we will go ahead and pray and get started today. Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for um, getting us in here safely, Jesus. Um, thank you for every person here. Lord, thank you for what you're doing in their life. Thank you for the people that, that couldn't make it in today. Um, easy at, at home being sick. We just pray for healing for him and, and sharing uh, Miller recovering from um, surgery. We pray for quick healing for her. And um, we pray for your blessing over, over your word today as we read it and get into it, that you would speak to us, Father. Um, we don't need to hear from a person. We need to hear from your word. We need to let it sink in and do what it does in our hearts. So we just pray that you would do that, Father. Um, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so today we are going to continue our series on the parables of Jesus. Um, today's parable is on the wheat and the weeds, or the, they call it tares also. Um, so a few years ago, and that's in Matthew 13, if you guys want to um, get ready for that. A few years ago, I was at the Nutter Center for an event. And you know when you're, you're sitting at the Nutter Center, you look around and there's just an arena full of people right? And we were just seated in this, this big auditorium, thousands of people around us, and I found myself looking around at, at all the people. And uh, I sat and I wondered, like, how many, how many there know Jesus? How many of, in this big crowd of people actually know Jesus? Like, what if we were to highlight them, right? Like, what if there was, like, a light that just shined off of them, like, in a real way? Would it, would it look like they were all separated to one side or another, or would they be in with everybody else? 
right? So I'm sure we would find people that know him, like throughout the whole venue, but we would also find people that, that don't know Jesus. But the point of it is, is they would be all mixed in together. We wouldn't see, see Christians on one side and, and non-Christians on the other. They, they are all together. And that's kind of like the way the world is, right? Like you don't find some states that don't have Christians and some states that do. Like we're not divided up by, by states or by countries. People who follow Jesus and people who don't are, are going to live, work, and grow together. That's the way it's always been. And that's the way it's always going to be until Jesus returns. And that is exactly what today's parable is about. Uh, Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed wing weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, don't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the, harvest, or uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So in this parable, Jesus is the sower, and the field that he's talking about is the world. And I say this right now because there's this, this widespread belief um, when it comes to this parable. Some people tend to think that Jesus is talking about true Christians growing up in the church, as well as people who aren't saved growing up in the church. And, and while it is a true statement that people, there are people in church who aren't saved, absolutely. I'll always say that, man. There's people in church that aren't saved. And there's people in jail that are. That's just the way, the way it is. That's not what this parable is about, though. Jesus goes on to say exactly what he means when we look ahead a few verses, uh, Matthew 13, 36 to 43. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the seed, the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom. Everything that causes sin in all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So Jesus is very specific in this, right? Letting us know what this parable means. He, Jesus is the son of man. We know this because he constantly calls himself the son of man. It's like his favorite nickname for himself. And the field is the world. Jesus straight up said that here. So if Jesus says that he is the sower and the world is the field that he's sowing, then the field can't be limited to the church that we're in. And besides, like this, this parable, it goes on to say that you don't weed out the bad weeds. So if this was about the church, that would actually go against what the Bible teaches about church discipline, because the Bible tells us that how we deal with unrepentant sinners in the church, or to confront sin in the church, not let it go, which is not what this parable says to do in this situation. So anyways, to get back to what it actually means, Jesus is explaining that in the world, believers are going to grow with non-believers. That's the way it's always going to be. We're not, we're not to take away, fight, or try to destroy those who aren't believers, though. Because here's the thing. Us and our clouded, non-God-like judgment are going to get that wrong. We always will. God does that in the end. God does his, his judgment and, and his weeding out, just like it says here. 
So we're going to let the Bible break this down a little bit further for us. John 6, 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up on the last day. So we know that Jesus sows seed and that he calls people to himself because of verses like this. They back it up. This verse is about God's sovereignty and salvation. But the point I want you to take away from it, I mean, that, that's a sermon in itself, but the point I want you to take away from it is that God sows. God works to raise up godly men and women. He does. We also know that the enemy has power and influence in this world. He's the one who sows the wheat. And we know that he's got people under his control. 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So right here we have two truths in the Bible that expressly state that God sows seed, but so does the devil. And the children of God are the wheat that Jesus talks about. And the, the seed that the enemy sows are the wheat who are under the control of the evil one. And the passage is clear when it says that an enemy sowed seeds in the field, and it's clear when it says we are not to pull them up. Look again what it says here in um, Matthew 13, 29 to 30. It says, no, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, from the beginning, people have not heeded the Bible's warning about this. And it's been met with horrendous and horrific results. History still remembers these. Um, the Spanish Inquisition is one where the, the Catholic Church sought out and punished people that they deemed as, as heretics. Uh, the Crusades, where um, people were forced to convert to Jesus or die. Um, witch hunts, other horrible acts have happened through history. Um, there was a queen uh, in England, one of the Tudors, Bloody Mary. She um, was went and killed anybody who was a Protestant, called him a heretic, killed him. Thousands of people. And this is totally against what the Bible teaches us. I, I don't know how, throughout history, throughout history, man, I don't know how that happens. I, I don't know how Christians have got it so wrong, people who, who claim to know and love Jesus and how they get it so wrong when it comes to things. Either going into things and, and persecuting those and killing those that, that are not Christians, which the Bible completely teaches against, or being passive and letting things happen. Um, Puritans, for one, they, they had a, a very... Um, strict and big outlook on the, on the Bible and followed it, but they sat by and let slavery happen. How, why, how is this okay? How is, how, is, how is letting horrible things when you know Jesus happen? How is, how is going out and killing people because they're not Christians, how is that okay? How... I'm going to start preaching in a second. Um, Luke 6.35 says, But love your enemies and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Love your enemies, it says, and do good, expecting nothing in return. Jesus tells us to love everyone, even those who might be considered an enemy. And it's not and has never been a Christian's calling to seek out those who aren't Christians for the sake of converting them or destroying them. It's just not. That's, that's God. And when we do, just like has, hap has happened in history, we're going to get it wrong. 
So the weed that it's talking about in this parable, or the tear, is more than likely something that's called darnel. Um, it's a common weed in that part of the world. And the thing about darnel is that it's almost indistinguishable from wheat until it actually mature, it matures. At that point, it blooms, and actually it's, it's poisonous in high volumes, which I think is a sermon in and of itself. But the point is, is much like these two, the weeds and the wheat, we don't know if God has plans for somebody's life. We don't know who's a weed and a wheat. How many times have we heard about somebody living their life the way they wanted to live, only to have Jesus rescue them right before they took their last breath? I mean, the goodness of Jesus and his power to save is beyond us. Um, and we know from the Bible that some people he calls from an early age, and others, like I was just saying, it's not until life is almost over. And when we try to decide who is going to know God and who isn't, we are playing a part that we're not meant, and we're not qualified to play. It's God who, who draws in and God who punishes for disobedience. It's not us. And, and I need you to hear me on this. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong that, that I'm not to say, I'm not saying that, that evil men don't deserve earthly punishment. That's, that's not what I'm saying at all. The, the Bible actually says that there are punishments for, for sins that we commit on earth, and it tells us how to, how to do that. And, and I'm not saying that, that war is always unjust. I, I believe it's true and right for able, godly men and women to stand up and stop evil people from committing evil. I, I believe it by force, if appropriate and necessary. I think, if you were to ask me, I think sometimes it's more sinful not to act than to act when you can. But for the purpose of playing God, and deciding who is wheat and who are weeds that get burnt, that decision is totally his. Romans 12, 19 to 21 says, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, it talks about loving your enemies and um, feeding and giving them, them drink. You're not going to hear me sitting up here saying that's easy. It's not. Like, man, I can think of times in my life where I've had people, if I were to give them a drink, I'd probably throw it at them. I'm just saying, like, just take it. This is what he's called us to do. You know why, though? Because when we were in our sins before we met Jesus, we were an enemy of God. And he moved towards us in love. He expects us to mimic that and what he's done for us. So our part is to love, show kindness, generosity. God's part is to judge and punish. And... and it, it gets hard sometimes, right? Like we look around and we see all the evil and the atrocities in the world, and it's hard to not be, I don't want to say angry, because anger in that kind of situation is a good thing. It, it is. There's a, there is a righteous and right kind of anger. When you see evil happening in the world and atrocities happening, and you get anger about that, that's righteous anger. That's a, that's a good thing. But when it comes to to judging for the sake of somebody's soul and trying to take them out because they are not wheat, because we think they're a weed, we have to remember that it's God's part to judge and punish. And, and I need to, to remind you of this. This is not a word that gets talked about in church. Probably not a lot. Um, but hell is a very real place. It absolutely is. And all of the sin in the world, 
all the sin that's being committed right now, all the sin that's going to be committed in the future, and all the sin that's been committed in the past is going to be dealt with. Every single sin ever committed, every sin that, that we've committed, every sin that, that people that don't know Jesus have committed, it's either going to be paid for by Jesus at the cross or it's going to be paid for by the person that committed committed it eternally in hell, separated from God. But God is righteous and just and good. And I always hear this argument. I, I always hear this, and it, it, it kind of, I, I get what they're saying, but I think we need to look at it different. I always hear this argument that the punishment of hell doesn't fit the crime. Right? We, we hear this a lot, that, that it's too big of a punishment for the crime that you commit on earth. But I think that when, when people say things like that, you need to be very careful. Because here's why. God is holy and perfect and just, right? Like the Bible says this, so we can agree on it. This is what the Bible says. So every decision that he makes that he's ever made, that he's ever going to make, is always going to be perfect, every time. He's always right. So if we say that hell is too big of a punishment for those who have sinned against God, what we're actually saying is that sinning against God is not that big of a deal. Right? How else can you put that? What we should be saying is, if hell... Is the, is the right punishment for sinning against God because we know God is always right. If hell is the right punishment, then how holy and awesome and powerful is God? If sinning against some, somebody like that will send you away to an eternity in damnation and that's the right punishment, then how big and mighty and holy is God? Right? That I mean, we do this thing to where we're we're saying sinning and rebelling against the God of the universe isn't that big of a deal, and that that doesn't fit the crime. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. That's not the case. God is holy and just and perfect and so far above what we can even grasp. And rebelling against his name the right punishment is damnation because that's what God says it is. God doesn't love that. God doesn't love to send people to hell. We, we shouldn't, we should make them jump over our bodies to get there. You know what I mean? We should be in front of people, letting them know the, the goodness and the kindness of God and that they are making a decision that that is... One, affecting their eternity, but it's also affecting their life here and now, right? Like, goodness, who can't say that they, they've regretted? Who can say they've regretted following Jesus? Like, man, I, I, I heard the gospel. I picked up the cross and, and follow him, and I've regretted it every single day. You never hear it, right? You just don't. But you hear countless testimony after testimony of God's faithfulness and being there and and people talking about how, no matter how bruised and beat up and broken they were, Jesus said, come to me. The, the fact of the matter is those that repeatedly ignore, ignore the calling of God, who deny what he's done for them, who continually choose to live life without him, God will honor that decision and let them live eternity without him. In a very big way, God is not making that decision. You are. When you choose not to accept Jesus, you are choosing not to accept him for eternity. But to get back to our original point, sin will be paid for. Jesus is either going to pay for it or we will. But that's God's decision and not ours. I think the big takeaway from this parable um, we should have is this, is not, not 
who are the wheat, but am I the wheat? I think we should, should check internally and ask, do we know him? Do we know him? The Bible says that the wheat bears fruit. Um, I have one more point in closing here. Um, in a minute, Kate and Isaiah are going are gonna to join us, and they have, a, they have a song that um, I believe is going to minister to us greatly. But John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. The Bible also says that we should, we should look at our own salvation. Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So I want to ask you, examine your hearts. Look at your fruit. Are you bearing fruit? I'm not asking if you're, you're perfect or if you ever sin. That would, that would take all of us out of it. It would take me out of it, absolutely, multiple times a day probably. I'm asking, is there evidence in your life that you're walking with Jesus? Do you know him? Are you standing in the gospel, or is it something that you just think about on Sundays? Are you the wheat? This is my question to you today. I'm not asking if you attend church or you tithe. I recently read a story about an elder and a church that realized she didn't know Jesus, and she got saved right in the middle of a service. I'm not asking if you're a Republican or Democrat. Contrary to belief of some people, there are believers and non-believers on both sides, both parties. I'm asking if you have a real and true relationship with Jesus. Not on Sundays in church, but throughout your life. Is there evidence of that? You can leave here today knowing that. I'm going to ask everybody to stand as the song is being played. And while they are singing this song, while Kate's singing this song, let it minister to your heart. Let it, let it speak to you. And if you have to do business with God, if you have to, if you're, if you're like, man, I don't know, Matt, I am not sure if I know him. Don't leave today. Ask him. Let him walk next to you. If there is any doubt, I invite you to come. The, the altar is open for you. You're more welcome to do it in your seat. God knows where you're at. But ask him. Don't leave here today doubting.
about a sermon and a song. I feel we all just got to preach something. Love you guys.